Um, welcome everyone to the Wagner Free Institute of Sciences weeknights at the Wagner Digital Talk Series. I'm Susan Glassman, director of the Wagner, and I'm delighted to have you join us for tonight's talk by historians and authors, Elliot Shaw and Katie Rawson, who will talk about a very important cultural institution, the restaurant. Their recent book, which you can see on the screen, uh, the cover of is Dining Out, A Global History of Restaurants. And it looks at the role that restaurants have played in the history of technology, race, gender, ethnicity, and politics, among other large subjects, and gives insight into the complex story of what is seemingly a simple place and one that we may have taken for granted until they all shut down very recently. Um, and as you could tell by the title of this talk, this is a second helping of this very delicious topic. And their first talk in July was so popular that we ran out of space on our Zoom account and they very kindly agreed to this encore per performance for which their timing is impeccable because as you may know, this also happens to be the first week of Restaurant Week in Philadelphia. So we're delighted to have them and delighted to have them open our series for the fall. Just a couple words about the Wagner before we start. For those who don't know, the Wagner is a natural history museum and educational institution located in Philadelphia. We're up in North Philly. We were founded in 1855 and we now have a dual mission, which is to teach contemporary science to the public but we also interpret and preserve the Wagner's historic building, which is now a time capsule of 19th century science. This talk is just one of many programs that we offer. And as it says in our name, the Wagner Free Institute, all of our programs are free and our goal is to make them truly accessible to everyone. We are located in a National Historic Landmark building, which also has a museum, a library, and a very historic lecture hall. Um, where many of our programs normally take place. While we've been closed for COVID, we've been adapting our programs to offer um, our programs remotely. And this fall, we're making all of our courses, lectures, science lessons, museum tours, and lots else uh, that we offer available to everyone from home. A quick intro with the program logistics for those of you who are joining us on Zoom for the first time. Uh, also uh, on your screen, you should see Corinne Woke, who is our communications and program coordinator, and she's gonna help manage the session. Uh, we've muted you and turned off video so we can all focus on the talk and without any background noise. So if for some reason you somehow get unmuted, just click it back off. Um, presentation will be about 45 minutes. Elliot is gonna open and then he'll be followed by Katie. And then we'll have lots of time for Q&A. The first time we did this, we ran out of Q&A time and um, we've left lots of time to address new questions as well as some of the amazing questions that people asked the first time. We're gonna do the questions through chat and Corinne will moderate. So please use your chat to post your questions. Corinne will deliver them and of course, Katie and Elliot will answer. Um, if you have general questions, just make sure you post them to everyone. But if you need technical help, send a private chat to me or Corinne and we'll try to help you out. Um, a quick plug for the Wagner. This program, like nearly everything we do, is free of charge. It's inherent in our name, but it is our mission to keep these programs free um, to, and to make them widely accessible. And it's something we've managed to do um, but it's a challenge for 165 years. Um, we've quickly adapted to make them available online while our building is still closed, but we do need support to make that happen. So if you enjoy our program um, and would like to see more of them, uh, we hope you'll consider making a donation or even joining the Wagner. So many of you I know are members and we thank you for your support. It makes it possible to do what we do and we're grateful. So now I'm gonna turn the program over to Elliot and Katie. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to start and spend about 20 minutes with you and Katie will um, do the next 20 minutes so we can have, hopefully by um, 7.30, we will have a half hour for questions. And I'm going to end my session um, 
with um, something from the book, actually directly from the book. I'm going to read you something from uh, the book that's about Philadelphia. So last time that we were here, um, we thought we were going to give a talk on global history of restaurants. We got lots of local kinds of questions. So we thought, um, we're not going to fight you. We're going to join you. So um, we're going to include um, things that were not, are not in the book, but the last bit that I will do comes directly out of the book. So if you want to know more about um, that restaurant, um, that will be fun. What we wanted to do this time was essentially start out by defining the restaurant. I don't think we did um, a great job of that last time because some people were saying, well, this is the, that's when there are older restaurants in that, or there have always been restaurants here or there. And, you know, how can you say that? And we can say that because we've taken the classic definition of a restaurant. Um, and there's um, what's happened recently and, and recently, really recently in the history of writing about food and eating is um, taking it as a serious um, subject. And one subject is, well, how did we get the restaurant that we have today? And um, if you think about when you go out to eat, um, there are four or five things that you expect to happen in a restaurant. And these are things that did, not, that did not come together right away. Um, and you know what they are, but you don't think about them when you go to a restaurant. There's a menu, for example. And by the way, the menu has prices. And somebody comes around and asks you what you would like to eat, what would you like to drink? That someone will go back to a kitchen and someone will cook it, hopefully, for you. It won't be sitting there on the stove like one French um, early place to eat that had um, a, a bouillon, which is chicken soup, um, and they claimed that it had been going on for a hundred years. They just kept throwing in new, new chickens and more water. So it's food cooked for you, and then it's served to you, right? And then at the end, you get a bill that says what you ate and how much it costs. Those things do not come together in the Western world until the mid, mid to late 18th century in, in Paris. And that comes together much earlier in the um, Eastern world, and in the world of China, 700 years beforehand. So it's a fascinating kind of a story. And that's what we probably did not make clear because everyone was telling us, oh, no, 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 there were older restaurants. Yes, there are always places to eat and drink. And so what we're going to do first is take a fairly quick tour through some places that you would eat and drink, and then end up um, with what we think are, is a, um, an 11th century um, depiction of restaurants in China. And then we'll move on to Philadelphia, early restaurants. And then Katie's going to take us on a tour of eating on the move and end with a little story about um, chains or one chain that you all know about and how it brings out so many of the issues that we think about in terms of culture and appropriation and ethnic restaurants. Okay, so Katie is going to move the slides for us. So would you go to the next slide? So what we're going to show you first are things that are not restaurants, all right? So these are people eating and drinking and have a good time in the 17th century. And the dogs are there and people are playing music and um, it's on a terrace, it could be a tavern, it could be someplace you eat and it was a lot of fun, but it's not a restaurant. Okay. Because you didn't get a bill probably at the end, or if you did, it, would, it wouldn't list what you ate or what you drank. Um, you would have no choices of what you would eat. There would just be a couple of things lying around that you would be served. Okay. Let's look at the next one, Kitty. Very similar, probably, um, you know, late 18th, early of uh, 19th century. Um, there, here we have someone bringing some food and drink, 
uh, could maybe be a restaurant, probably isn't. Looks like a tavern, again, which it wouldn't, where there wouldn't be many choices. Um, and it might be a place where you could only get one or two things and you would have to pay a fixed price to eat that. So um, has some of the aspects of being a restaurant, but uh, probably not. Why don't we look at the next one? Can I mention one thing about the Please, previous maybe. image in this one? Yeah. Uh, so in the previous image, you'll also notice that people didn't have their own tables, which is one of the things that the restaurant gave us. Um, and in this scene, I'm pretty sure that she's shucking oysters for them, which yeah. was really common in taverns that there wasn't like, <laughs> there wasn't like a menu, right? Like there was just the food that was there. Thank you, Katie. And please interrupt at any time. You don't interrupt. So this, um, the next series of things that you're going to look like and uh, look at are also, again, not restaurants. Um, this one, and one we'll see a little bit later, uh, is about drinking and probably uh, a depiction of the symposium. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the next one. Um, here we have a cook shop. And these cook shops were classic in uh, the Near East or the Middle East. Um, like the one on the right is likely uh, from Cairo. Um, and it's a place where there would be one thing that they would make. Uh, like uh, pizza a little bit later, actually several centuries later. Um, a soup or uh, something that would be put uh, on some kind of bread. Um, and that's what you would eat when you were visiting a town or going shopping, okay? So essentially uh, a very simple kind of a place where there was one thing to buy and one thing to pay for. And often in cities, people didn't necessarily have kitchens. So it was a way for people to get the meals that they would take home. So takeout is um, something that we've had for millennia. And these are good examples of that. How about the next one? So here we have the classic symposium, um, the, the Greek story of drinking um, together and uh, eating together a little bit, tiny bit of eating, mostly more drinking than eating. Uh, it was for men and women would come and serve and entertain. And this is the um, the, the notion that we have today of a symposium is more of an uh, academic one. Um, and this is, um, you know, something that's 2000 years old or more and has aspects of, you know, people are eating and drinking together, but it's uh, in a private home, in a special room, in an upper class home and um, certain guests who were um, invited um, to be together and often it ended up in horrible drunken uh, uh, orgies. I don't mean in a sexual sense, but just sort of throwing things around and, uh, and acting silly. So, um, which is something that we probably <laughs> are seeing on college campuses right now. So why don't we move on to the next one? So that's not a restaurant. So we're finally getting to a restaurant the first restaurants that do all of the kinds of things that we talk about, that we talked about at the beginning, start in China in, during the Song Dynasty in Hangzhou and Kaifeng. And uh, in the 11th and 12th century, 1000s, 1100s. And we have full, we talked about this last time, so we won't spend much time on it. But I want to go to the next slide, which gives you a sense of um, the capaciousness of restaurants. We don't really, I mean, one of the problems in doing this kind of work is we don't have um, detailed visual evidence, but in China we have detailed written evidence. And the evidence is clear that in China at this point, everything that has to do with the, his, with the beginning of a true restaurant um, is available here. Um, you'd have a menu, you'd have a waiter, the food would be cooked for you, there'd be um, a bill that you would pay at the end. Um, and you would also, there was another aspect of the restaurant that has mostly disappeared, I assume, which was a private room for private kinds of things. And, um, and these all show up only in the West again 
in um, France in the middle of the 18th century. But what's most important here to remember, and you'll, we'll pick it up much later on, is ethnic restaurants um, were there at the beginning because we're talking about a part of China where sort of east, uh, north and south meet. And um, there is a place where many merchants spend time, people are moving back and forth. And I think I mentioned last time, those of you who are here, we think the reason for this happening in the West, in the Eastern part of the West, is that this, these cities were um, at least five times the size of, of cities in Europe. So when Paris had 200,000 inhabitants, uh, Hangzhou had a million inhabitants. And um, so this, this will give you a sense, probably most historians think is the reason it's a center for uh, trade and it's an enormously populous city. So the ethnic restaurant shows up right away because the people from the north who came there wanted to eat their own food there and the people from the south wanted to eat their own food there and so they were right in the middle and there were um, ethnic restaurants of every kind. The reason we know this is that all of these establishments um, and all of their menus um, have been kept in Chinese archives. Um, we in the West uh, need to learn something from the Chinese <laughs> on how to keep records. Okay, why don't we move on, Katie? And let's move to the city of brotherly love, um, to the Blue Anchor Tavern, which we know is the first place that anyone ate out in Philadelphia. And I'm just gonna switch to, my, to another set of notes. Um, it's not the oldest restaurant in the area. There was a, I'm sorry, I used the wrong word. Uh, it's not the only tavern available in the area. Um, there's one that may be one year older that's still around. If you've ever been an ambler, the Broad Axe Tavern is 1681. Um, the Blue Anchor, though, is, I believe, 1682. And um, as you can tell, I can do everything else by heart, but I can't about <laughs> the Blue Anchor Tavern. It is 1681 and, um, excuse me, 1682. It was built by George Guest. It was the earliest inn or tavern in Philadelphia. It was here that William Penn first broke bread on the soil that was to be Philadelphia. And you can uh, clearly see an anchor on the sign near the entrance to the tavern. And it shows three people approaching the entrance, two others fishing on the water's edge. There are two rowboats that lie in the riverbank and a sailboat is nearing the land. And where this is, is at where Dock, um, excuse me, <coughs> where Dock Creek um, hits the Delaware River. So it was a perfect spot for William Penn to, um, to get his first meal. Can we go to the next one? So this is the London Coffee House. And um, I guess I wanna call your attention, this is the middle of the 18th century. So this is exactly when in Paris, the first restaurants are, um, are started. Um, so this is a tavern, a place where you would get what we were talking about before, some drink and some simple food that was um, told what you were going to have. You know, there were just a couple of things on the quote unquote unwritten menu. Um, but this is also a sad, um, sad thing to look at. Those are women who are Africans who are being sold into slavery. And, you know, the, the, what I find fascinating about this is the way it's just an everyday, it looks like an everyday experience. People are walking down the street, people are at the front of the tavern, and um, 
there's a slave auction going on outside and people are watching it. So, um, yeah, the, so the um, London Coffee House lives into the um, 20th, into the, um, it's, it's founded in the 18th, in 1754, but it is, um, it exists into the 1820s and 30s and um, disappears shortly after that. And one more. So what happened, people asked, what were the first actual restaurants in Philadelphia? The first actual restaurants in Philadelphia were um, ho likely hotel restaurants. I have not been able to figure out which one was the first one. Um, but there is a wonderful historian of, um, of food in Philadelphia, William Boyce Weaver, who is going to be um, giving a talk for the library company where he's doing research on exactly that. So I'm going to let him um, answer that question. But this is a um, fabulous Philadelphia story. James Parkinson, <clears throat> he was a confectioner and a son of a tavern keeper. And he operated not only a famous restaurant at 180 Chestnut Street, is what you're looking at, but and produced Philadelphia's then most popular ice cream. It wasn't Bassett's, it was Parkinson's. But also in 1851, so very near the time that the Wagner's coming into existence, there was a essentially almost like the a great British bake-off. It was the great fight between New York and Philadelphia, who had the best restaurant. And of course, Philadelphia had the best restaurant. It beat, uh, it bested New York's Delmonico's. And Delmonico's is the consensus choice for the first true restaurant in the United States. And um, so Parkinson's is not the first, but there was a 17 course cook-off dinner later called the thousand dollar dinner that earned him a standing ovation. So I want you to know that even though by 1851, Philadelphia was no longer the biggest city in the United States, but New York was. By the way, Philadelphia tries to become the biggest city in the United States by incorporating the city and county into the city of Philadelphia and still doesn't pull it off just a few years after this. Um, this thousand dollar restaurant. So this might've been the last hurrah for Philadelphia being the number one city. So I wanna end my piece, not with a thousand dollar meal, but a much cheaper meal. And I don't have, we don't have a picture uh, or a depiction of this place. We don't know even if it actually existed. It was written in a book published in the mid 1850s called in German, the Geheimnisse von Philadelphia, or the mysteries or the secrets of Philadelphia. And for those of you who are mid 19th century folks, you will recognize that as a series of novels that were written about Paris, about New York, about London, about Cincinnati, St. Louis. Um, the, the ones written about Cincinnati, St. Louis and Philadelphia were all written in German. Um, and the, this German book, um, does not exist as far as we know in its full, um, in its full sense, it was published in pieces, but in it is a description of a restaurant that looks so absolutely lifelike that one imagines that it was real. And there are um, all kinds of reasons to, to believe that. It's a book that um, I translated into English and haven't yet published yet because we only have the first um, 50 or so pages. So I'm going to read you a bit from our book and then turn things over to Katie. For, so poor people's restaurants is the part of the book. For the poor, as for the middle class, eating in restaurants may have started around the middle of the 19th century. These establishments were almost always self-service and the food was not necessarily cooked to order. So our idea of what a restaurant is starts to dissolve from what we think of a French restaurant back to some of these cook shops or these taverns. These establishments were almost always self-service and the food was not necessarily cooked to order. 
we have a marvelous description of one such establishment, a cross between a cafeteria, a tavern, and a takeaway shop. So the poor would not eat in restaurants, but would eat in these kinds of places. From a mid-century novel written in German in Philadelphia, Mike Clapman's Tavern and Restaurant was run by an Irishman serving German food to men and women, black and white, in a rickety building on the southern outskirts of the city. For those of you who know um, Philadelphia history, Philadelphia's boundaries were the Delaware and the Schuylkill and um, Vine Street and South Street. So this would have been in the neighborhood of South Street. So that was the size of Philadelphia in the 1850s until it incorporates in the mid 1850s, the entire county. Upon entering, this is a direct quote from the book. Upon entering the front room, which was really the dining room, one was taken aback by the extraordinary fittings of the restaurant. The buffet table was filled with the richest selection of dishes, exactly like that of the fashionable restaurants of Chestnut Street. And let me add that this book goes back and forth between the rich and the poor. It's a fascinating, if somewhat difficult to, um, to take book. The only difference was in the kind of foods in the bowls in which they were kept and the art and manner in which they were dispensed. In two rows, one behind the other, stood 20 large, big, shiny red clay pots, and in each one was stuck a large tin ladle. In one was pickled pig's knuckles, in another giblet stew, in a third pork and sauerkraut, in a fourth white beans, in the fifth yellow pea soup, the sixth apple butter, the seventh mashed carrots and potatoes, the eighth plum jam, and the others marinated oysters, fish and meats of most different kinds, fried liver and potatoes boiled in their skins, and on top of that, fruit, fruchtkuchen, pies of all possible combinations. One could eat at Mike's in two ways, either bringing along a dish, from home to fill with the restaurant's food for takeaway, or eating inside using the restaurant's tin plates. A ladle full costs one cent. This price per amount model was and continues to be a popular method for the least expensive restaurants. So to go back to what Katie said before, in the mid 19th century in poor areas, people did not usually have kitchens or places to cook. So th this would have been the kind of place that would have been, would, and this is a description from <laughs> literally the same year that James Parkinson does his thousand dollar dinner a mile away um, is Mike Clapton's Tavern. So with that um, description of a German American Irish um, uh, interracial restaurant, um, let's move over to Katie and thank you for listening so far. I'm going to take us through thinking about restaurants as spaces that are um, shaped and that shape travel. So last time that we were here, we talked a lot about um, cities as a real catalyst for the development and for change in restaurants. The other real catalyst and piece that, uh, that develops restaurants is this notion of traveling. Um, and so uh, as we talked about, there are all sorts of places to eat on the road uh, are very early in basically in humanity, right? Like as soon as people start moving, they often need places to eat on the road. Um, so these are some of the very earliest businesses uh, and you especially see them crop up around uh, major roadways, major paths. Um, and so this is an example uh, from in Japan, but you can see again, this doesn't quite fit uh, our, our like more solid definition of a restaurant, right? This woman is serving people out of her home. There probably is just the meal that you would eat in the same way that if you were at an inn in Spain along um, one of the pilgrimage roads, you might have the same kind of experience. But uh, once restaurants get started, we really see that travel is one of the things that transforms them and where they really, uh, where they really pick up steam, which is uh, uh, appropriate because really lots of this is driven by train travel. 
Um, so uh, many of our early restaurants that are the kind of formal high restaurants that end up being remembered, that people uh, write histories about, are these kinds of restaurants that happen in hotels. Uh, so this is kind of a classic version. It's a very beautiful cafe at the Waldorf Astoria. You'll notice that it's a gentleman's cafe, so this is a place where women wouldn't have been allowed, um, even though clearly it is uh, beautiful and formal and probably not unseemly, um, but they still wouldn't have been allowed. You'll also notice that, again, going back to some of our definitions about tables, uh, about restaurants, is that each of these has an individual table that people would be sat at, unlike many inns where you would just sit with whoever happened to be at the long bench that you were at. Um, this is yet another image of this. You'll notice that these places have like large windows, large mirrors, chandeliers often, which are all the trappings of what turned restaurants into destination places. Um, and places that we don't even think of as being part of restaurants anymore, like the Savoy, which in, I think for many people, just becomes like a kitchen unto itself. Uh, it's where Escoffier got his start. It's, it's super important in like the history of restaurants. Uh, but it is in fact a hotel. And the reason that people would have gone there in many cases would be because they were traveling um, and because there was this moment of like high-end travel and, and adventure through eating. So I really love this the story behind this picture and before, behind these kinds of hotels. So there are a whole bunch of hotels that are literally built along um, along trains uh, for people to then come and eat and stay, right? Like the point is that you might just build a railroad and then be like, hmm, how are we going to get people to use our railroad? So I think the, the famous American version of this is Flagler um, and, uh, and the things that he built up in Florida. Uh, but also in Canada, the Canadian Railway, they built these really gorgeous hotels with these really opulent restaurants with the idea that uh, restaurants were a kind of destination, that it was kind of a really like luxurious experience to go to a restaurant. At the same time, also, this is a moment when um, when most travel is being done by rail. Uh, and so in addition to having these like destination kind of adventure restaurants, you also just have lots of people who have to eat because they are traveling in the same way that people had to stop on, on the road in inns. Um, and so this is a kind of beautiful little sketch uh, by Manet of a railway restaurant. Um, but I want to read you really quickly a little bit about these restaurants uh, in part because I think that uh, that how how people being forced to eat where the rails take you really helped change what the restaurant industry is. Um, so uh, in 1869, novelist Anthony Trollope provided perhaps the most poetically rich description of the poor food that train stops served. He described his rail station sandwich as a white sepulchre, fair enough outside, but so meager, poor, and spiritless within, um, which I just really love the like sad, <laughs> the grave image of what food would have been like. And, um, and if you look at the travel writing from the time, people just rail against railway food um, and how completely terrible it is. And so uh, this leads to two really important uh, kinds of paths in dining around travel. Um, so this is a later railway station where at least the interior is beautiful. Um, but uh, the, first, the first kind of reinvention that we see is that because eating at the station is so terrible, so basically what would happen is if you were on a very long train ride, um, you, would, you would be on a train, the train might stop, it might stop for just a few minutes, um, 
you might be able to get off and find something to eat, but that would have to mean that there was something close enough. Often what happened was there were people who would, um, who would make their money by bringing food to, uh, to the train stations and they would sell it to people through the window. There are some really beautiful books about this um, and about African-American women who, uh, who really like made their way by going to, to trains and like basically selling people food uh, who would then just like sit in their seats and eat. But it wasn't a particularly pleasant experience. Um, and so uh, Pullman had the idea that uh, things could be done differently. And so in um, 1869, I believe, I will check that date. In 1868, actually, uh, George Pullman debuted the first dining car. And so one of the things I love about these dining cars is that after you have looked at the pictures of what hotel restaurants look like in the 19th century, in all of their like luxurious bigness, one can totally see that these dining cars are designed immediately after that, like including the kind of color, the way that the chandeliers are built, the fact that, um, that they are just set up to basically be replicas. Uh, in fact, one of the early railroad cars was in fact named the Delmonico because the idea was that you were supposed to feel like you were in a real restaurant. So these spaces, as you can see, are intensely beautiful. But one of the things that I personally find amazing about them is not just their beautiful interiors and like every single uh, railroad line had their own um, china and their own spoons and it was, it's really kind of a neat history. But what I find amazing is that you have people who are making all of this very high-end food um, in kind of a luxurious space. I think that these that might be a lobster. It wouldn't be surprising if it is. Um, and they were generally in kitchens that were uh, 2.4 meters by 2.4 meters. So that's eight by eight feet, uh, which is might be smaller than most of the rooms in your house. Uh, it's, it's a very tiny space. And there would be uh, they would serve up to 48 customers at one time. So in an eight by eight space, you would be making food for 48 people. Um, and generally everything was brought in at the stops. And one of the things that I like is that often these places uh, which uh, had generally also uh, black cooks and black staff in the same way that many of the people who were servers were also black, um, they would have authority though within their kitchen. So basically they would have a budget to get the things that they needed um, that was out of the train budget. And uh, again, some of them in the same way that the women who stole it at who uh, who sold at uh, at train stations really could like make a living like there was really a way in the same way that Pullman porters can move into the middle class for these uh, for these people in the kitchen to move into the middle class and also I think that it is just like such a feat of cooking to be moving in the heat and of a kitchen and also manage to make food in that little space. Um, and in the book, we tell the story of one of these cooks. His name is Jane, James Copper, uh, and uh, he basically ended up in like a kind of long-term friendship with a guy who was the prime minister of Poland for a while. And basically, every time this guy came to America, he would be like, I need Mr. Copper to be on my train because I want him to be making my food. So. Part of the solution to very lousy railway food uh, was the invention of dining cars. The other response was the, the making of these new kinds of railway restaurants. Um, and last time we were here, I talked about the Harvey girls who are these waitresses who are really like making their way in the world and really changing what waitressing is. The Harvey house itself also really changed how restaurants worked. Um, so it, it's one of the very, very early restaurant chains. And so what that meant was that at every stop uh, along many routes there was a Harvey house um, and because of that they ended up 
creating the kinds of systems that we see chains use in order to um, elevate the kinds of products that they can serve, the consistency of the food that they're serving, and also cut costs, right? So instead of um, 50 restaurants that all had to order beef, they would order beef in one fell swoop, um, and because of that, it was such a large quantity that they could really get a discount on it. At the same time, they also, because again, even though these restaurants were really beautiful, people often still only had somewhere between a half an hour and, a, and 45 minutes to like come in, make an order, get their food and go. They also created these kinds of elaborate uh, serving systems where people would be able to signal with their cups whether they wanted food or not, um, whether they wanted coffee or tea. And the the whole system, like everybody in the system, all of the Harvey girls, all the people who ran the kitchens, basically could run it as a kind of, um, of well-oiled machine, which is something that we then see really adopted and proliferating across what restaurants become, right? Like this is, this is how we get much of the fast food and chain restaurants that we know, is the kind of implementation of, um, of uh, Taylorism in the restaurant. Okay, so the last little piece that I'm going to talk about uh, is what happens when we get away from rail and when we move into the era of cars. Uh, and so really, when you, when you are on a railway, you know that your customer is there, you know that they are captive, but when we move to cars, we see kind of a vastly different scene. Um, and lots of this scene actually begins not with high-end restaurants in the way that, uh, that our story about trains begins, but it really begins with things that aren't restaurants at all, right? So uh, this is a lunch wagon for bean pickers. The idea is that uh, someone would basically just bring lunch to where people are. It's all mobile um, and has low overhead, so, lots, so it's available as a job for lots of people. Um, and then they would, folks would get their food. This kind of very simple wagon um, really morphs uh, over time and you end up with these really elaborate lunch wagons which then turn into what we know as diners. So when we have um, early roadways, early highways, uh, we end up having all of these places along them that are actually designed to be mobile. So uh, Often also places would close up for the winter, uh, but right, because early car culture, cars were freezing. They didn't necessarily have roofs or heat. People really motored in the summer and then they would put their cars away. And so lots of these places were really like seasonal, very mobile. And because of that, they had um, a kind of low overhead. They often went untaxed. Um, there was a way that they managed to be businesses uh, in a kind of economic edge, which I have to say, I've been thinking a lot more about like, what does it look like when people who are running restaurants are are like stretched thin, like what are the examples of that? And I think that if we look back to this history of what people were doing with road food when it first started, before it became uh, Howard Johnson's and McDonald's, um, there are actually a lot of people to like guide us in a sense of, of play and also in a sense of what it looks like for things to be um, precarious but to keep going. So to take things in some ways full circle back to the ways that travel brings us fine dining. When people first had cars, also the notion of like driving around and going places wasn't yet established. And so uh, the history of the Michelin Guide, I think is just an amazing story of how restaurants help to make the driving industry um, and vice versa. So the initial Michelin Guide uh, was an idea of people at the Michelin Tire Company. They wanted to sell more tires. They wanted folks to drive more. Um, and so they gave out free Michelin Guides at, uh, at, the, at the exposition. Let me actually turn to the page really quick so that I can get y'all the exact dates. Um, 
and which exposition it was. So it was the World's Fair in Paris uh, in uh, 1900. And so at that World's Fair, they also debuted, people also debuted conveyor belts, uh, escalators, x-ray machines, and Campbell's canned soup. Uh, <laughs> so it was a very important World's Fair, and this is also when we get the Michelin Guide. And so uh, the people who were running the Michelin Company decided that they were going to basically build a guide that was going to tell people about restaurants that were in other parts of France that they might not know about. Um, and so at that point, it really was just describing things that people hadn't seen before, telling them that there were these wonderful restaurants as a way of encouraging them to get in their cars and use up their tires. Uh, but it really caught on and has turned into the basically giant industry we have now of Michelin, where a Michelin star will make or break your restaurant. Um, I Maybe, shall, shall I end with that? Or shall we? Shall we move on to questions? You know, you might want to uh, mention, Katie, that for the folks who weren't here last time, we had those other guides. Yes, yeah. Which, and um, useful, and then maybe go to McDonald's and then go to questions. Yep, that sounds great. Uh, so when we were here before, and I, I thought about including this, but we had talked about it. Um, so along with the Michelin Guide, there were also guides that were created in the United States. So Michelin Guides were created for French people and also people all over the world who would have been in France. Um, uh, in the United States, there was uh, a guide by Duncan Hines that was really for white people to tell them what restaurants to go to. Um, but at this time, things were often not safe for black travelers. And at the same time that the uh, Duncan Hines guide came out, another guide called The Green Book, which some of you have probably heard of, also came out. It's uh, developed by Victor Green, who is a postman. Um, and he was using his postal networks, which I feel like is also like a beautiful story for 2020. Um, so he himself wasn't much of a traveler, but he knew that people had a hard time finding safe places to eat um, and safe places to stay. And so basically he got together and um, solicited from a bunch of his other postal friends of like, okay, in the places that you work, where is it safe? for black people to drive in and eat? Like where will people be able to uh, not be harassed, not be hurt? Um, and uh, it ran from 1935, I think, 34, thanks. <laughs> um, from 1934 to, uh, to a little, I think that 67 was the last one. Um, after, after the Civil Rights Act, um, right, the landscape just totally changed around uh, where people could go. And also, I think really the kinds of discourses around what it meant uh, to like travel and eat out if you were Black in America. Um, but it's a really lovely story that really is about uh, building things from the community, right? That he is, he's started with the people that he worked with and then um, readers also in the future uh, editions of it would send him in lists of places that they could eat at. Um, and so I guess I will end by coming back to McDonald's, which I think is, is like a kind of beautiful bookend for where Elliot started, which is like, we are defining restaurants as places where the following things happen. Um, and at the other end of that, after you have gone through a world of very high hotel service, uh, you come back on the other end to things that really kind of look like our earlier cook shops, our earlier taverns, but they've been completely transformed. Um, and I think that one of the ways that we can think about how McDonald's is totally transformed by having come after the invention of the restaurant as we defined it is the fact that it has a 10 item menu built around a 15 cent hamburger. So the idea is that you still do go in, you still do order what you want. Um, it is still about um, a structure of choice and individuality, which is not something that these earlier 
uh, proto restaurants had, right? Like taverns aren't about choice. They aren't about you as like a special flower. Whereas McDonald's really is trying to be about you as a special flower. Um, and that that is part of the way that people there make money. And, uh, and to go back to the discussion of our early Chinese restaurants and the notion of ethnic restaurants, it also means that as McDonald's has gone across the world that uh, one of the things that they have had to figure out how to do is how to walk into cultures where uh, where they would be the interesting ethnic food but that also there are already like cultural mores and cultural notions of what one should eat and figuring out how do you keep the thing that makes you unique um, and at the same time fill in and fit in and become something that people in another culture, like say Indonesia, um, want to eat. And in the book, there's a really lovely story about, uh, about Indonesian McDonald's, but I will leave that for the Q&A, I guess. Um, and also, I guess, to tack back to that, this is like the story of McDonald's as ethnic restaurants is also really the experience of many ethnic restaurateurs, right? Like the idea is that you are often someone who has come from a different place and you are starting a restaurant and the thing that you have that is appealing to people is that you have something that is novel, that they haven't eaten before, that they are excited about eating, um, or you have something that's super familiar for people who are coming from the culture that you came from. And at the same time, you have to then like fit your service model or fit your food um, in the ways that we know that all food changes when it moves to another place. And so with that, uh, we'll stop and have questions. Sorry, I forgot I turned off my own video screen, thought I wasn't up here. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, we've had a couple questions come in and um, if anyone has more, please send them in the chat and I'll relay them. And the first one is why is Broadax not a restaurant? Well, it is now, but it wasn't in 1681. That's the point. Uh, in 1681, it probably um, had um, one or two things that you would eat and it had some things that you would drink. It was probably mostly an inn, um, which we didn't really talk about. An inn is a place where you, you know, sort of like a hotel um, for travelers. And um, all around Philadelphia, there's, a, by the way, a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, resource for Philadelphia. It's the Encyclopedia of Philadelphia. It's on online and has some marvelous stories and well, well done things. The, the piece on rest, uh, on what he calls restaurants, uh, Stephen Napa wrote, and um, it's um, it's it's beautifully done. And it's so each one of the radial um, routes out of Philadelphia, the Old York Road, um, Germantown Avenue, um, the things that all go radial, Ridge Avenue, all of those things that go out into the um, hinterlands of Philadelphia had taverns and which were inns. And so, you know, travelers would stay in them the way Katie was talking about in terms of, um, in terms of railroads, you could think about in terms of riding horses or um, riding in a wagon or in a coach of some sort with more people. So, so those are often, there are many of them that are still around. It's just, that's the only one that, that's the oldest one. There are a number of others, and it wasn't a restaurant per se, okay? It didn't have the kinds of things that Katie was just describing again, that whole list that we talked about at the beginning. Um, is the Michelin, the tire company, still making the Michelin guides, or are they independent? Katie? Oh, I I do know the answer to that. I believe that the company does still do it, but let me check to make sure that that is correct. And of course it does it now all over the world. Right? Mm -hmm. so, um, some restaurateurs, I don't know how many of you follow these kinds of things, have refused to be part of the Michelin Guide 
because it locks, some of them said it locks them into a certain kind of cuisine and a certain kind of perfection that is, um, has actually ruined some restaurateurs' lives because the pressure on them to keep their stars are, are so important that um, it becomes, um, you know, like a, a form of forced servitude instead of the joy of cooking for folks. Katie? Yeah, so the Michelin Company is still, uh, they, they still are the people who employ uh, all of our Michelin reviewers. I had no idea. Um, I know a few years ago there was the like worldwide story of that um, French chef who I think they dropped one star from his rating yes. and he went on like a crusade. He said they claimed that he used cheddar cheese and he would never use cheddar cheese and like tried to kind of ruin Michelin, I think. Um, and I actually have my own question while we're talking about Michelin. Originally, um, was it as like professional um, of a review system and was the dining, I assume the restaurants weren't as fancy in the original ones. It was more kind of what is decent in this area, right? Yeah, so it uh, they were not as fancy. It initially was not professionals. It was, um, so initially the way that they did it was that uh, there were uh, salesmen who would go out to different areas in France selling Michelin tires um, and it, the salesmen themselves would be the one to, ones to say like this is a great restaurant in this place um, and then over time now they have like as people probably know they have like a professional staff um, and that professional staff is also like really secretive. There's a really wonderful article about it, which I wish I could remember what publication it was in. Um, but yeah, like the the kinds of expenses and secrecy of uh, Michelin reviewing now is very different from how it started, which really was like, you know, a company, like a company put together book. What is the date and location of the earliest surviving menu that you were able to find? In, in the West or the East? <laughs> uh, the menu the of the Chinese restaurants in the, not the Chinese restaurants, the restaurants in China mm -hmm. in the 11th century are all extant in the archives. So, but in the West, um, Katie, you worked at the Menu Project at the New York Public Library. Yeah, all of those menus were were later. I mean, my my guess is that our earliest menus are really from the 1760s, right? They're from like the very beginning of restaurants. I mean, it depends on whether you mean menus that are restaurant menus or menus that are banquet menus. So banquet menus have been popular as long as like wealthy people have wanted to tell folks <laughs> what they were doing, right? Like that, uh, that those kinds of menus um, we have recorded. We have a lot of those recorded. Um, we also have Delmonico's menus, and Delmonico's is the first restaurant in the United States that yep. has all of those kinds of things. So, and it's pages and pages and pages. Yeah, and these early menus, like many of them, are just—they're uh, like beautiful and absurd. Uh, they'll just be like twenty pages of different dishes that you can get, and the idea was that uh, many of them you wouldn't the restaurant wouldn't actually have the ingredients for, but your waiter would like help you. And sometimes there would be like little marks on the menu that would let you know, like, yeah, no, we know there are strawberries there. You can't get strawberries. I feel like I've encountered that in Philadelphia sometimes where you <laughs> order something and they're like, oh, we don't have it. It's unclear. <laughs> um, this question is, I loved the concept of the rules, so to speak, of what a restaurant was. How do you integrate the tavern slash restaurant style slash food aspects, fast food, etc., as aspects of restaurants? Yeah, so I think that for us, it in some ways it really is about how uh, restaurants change 
the culture of human interaction, right? That like what these rule, what these kinds of rules do is that they start to change how people think about going out to eat, right? Like it, it is, uh, it's a shift in thinking about um, dining places as uh, spaces of collective conviviality, which we continue to see in like clubs and taverns and other kinds of places that continue on. But now there's also a kind of discourse that doesn't exist before that is really about um, like individuals' experiences, individuals' desires, like very small parties going out and doing these kinds of things in public, um, and also the notion of individual choice. And what we see in the early 19th century is that, um, that lots of places that used to be inns and taverns and coffee houses adopt all sorts of things from restaurants. So they, they start, uh, they start printing their own menus. They start taking out their giant tables and putting in little individual tables. Um, and I think that one of the things that all of us can see is that like, oh, all of this stuff really waxes and wanes, right? So that at a certain point, people who have taken out their big tables and put in all of these individual tables because they're being more restaurant-like, then there's like a new move in restaurants and everything is like a giant bench. Um, and so I, I think that part of it for, for our book really is about thinking about how um, how these kinds of small technologies of the restaurant change experience and then also how they change consumer demand, right? Like the notion that this is about you. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about the shift back and forth between big communal tables versus kind of privacy or small tables. Right? Um, and this is out of order, so anyone who already asked, don't worry. Um, but it seems like a good segue to the question of where does social isolation dining fit into your research now? You repeat that again? Oh, sorry. Um, where does social isolation dining fit into your research now? So what's going on now? Is that, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess really it's interesting what you're observing or writing about. The first restaurant in, in Paris, we think, some of this stuff we don't really know. Um, what I what I read you uh, uh, to you about the German American restaurant, and a lot of the work in the uh, in our book that's really outstanding is Katie finding things in novels, um, because this wasn't a serious thing that one de uh, described in history books in the 19th century. So we've been digging things out of, of novels which seem to uh, to be close to the story, but the original first restaurants, perhaps, <laughs> in Paris, were where you would go to eat alone. You would sit at a table and have um, bouillon, or some kind of health food. Um, and part of it, I want to pick up, there's a question about um, upper middle class and commodification of luxury. In some ways, it was for the, uh, at least in Paris and in France, it was for the upper class and the upper middle class. But they wanted to get away from the gigantic um, overfeeding at, uh, at home. If you lived in a, um, a royal family or a high bourgeois family, you'd literally have to dress for dinner every night and eat these, you know, extraordinary meals. So the restaurant in some ways was a, uh, a retreat from having to be home <laughs> and <laughs> all dressed up and eat all this heavy, um, probably not very palatable food. So some of the early restaurants that we think we know about, like the place that made the chicken soup, um, you would sit there quietly and be served by a person and eat it and pay and go home um, to your very wealthy house. I mean, think about it now, eating at home, socially distanced is, more of a luxury, in, at least in the West, than it is to eat out, that you make your own food at your own home from scratch, and it tastes really good, is for many people a um, special, instead, instead of going to a restaurant. 
for a special meal. So it's a, it's a really fascinating, I think these things go back and forth and the, the pandemic probably is showing signs of that. Katie, you, you might have some other things you want to say about that. Yeah, um, I, so I think that both of us probably have had people who have been asking us like, what will restaurants look like on the other side of this crisis? Um, which is something that like I, I think about because I love restaurants and also because I study them. Um, and, and as I think someone was mentioning, it's not like this is the first time that we've experienced um, a crisis and that restaurants have rebounded. And, uh, and I guess that I think that one of the things that looking at what happens um, when places, when people are strapped, like thinking about um, how automation works. I actually was just reading an article yesterday that was talking about um, uh, robotics in the food industry and like what's going to happen with thinking about, especially in fast and fast casual food, um, with more of these things becoming mechanized, whether that's going to be part of what comes out of this. Um, my sense, though, is that this is a kind of institution that isn't easily broken. Um, and so I think that that even though we will probably have hard times uh, for our restaurateurs and we should try and help them out if we if we want them to be around, um, that it is something that will that will survive and that um, in 10 years we'll have really interesting stories to tell about how people weathered the crisis. Corinne, you're, you're muted. Yeah, the, the second part of the question about um, the commodi commodification of luxury was, um, and the intro to that question was, if the person is a recent food studies grad and, and librarian um, and plans to buy your book. Um, but did Chinese restaurants have that type of economic surge when its restaurants were originally or initially created? Well, I think um, we covered that to some extent because um, it's in these two incredibly um, populous cities where trade was moving back and forth. And um, these were the, the major hubs of, um, of, of mercantile trade. It's also, the other thing that's part of this is, um, and we recommend that you read our book about this, <laughs> was the change in the government in China a much uh, a, a, a relaxing and easing of imperial uh, power. And, um, and, it's, and if you think about it, um, some people are not sure about this, but um, the same kind of thing happens in France in the 18th century. You have the rise of the middle class and the upper middle class who are contending for power in, uh, in you know, ultimately a successful revolution. So um, this is the mo so some people have linked it to that. Um, whether that's true or not is something I don't think anyone could ever prove. But there, so it's a governmental change and it's a change um, in who is making money and how they're making it. And, um, and so if you think about an urbanized area where there are many, there are many more things to sell, many more things to buy, people have to eat, um, people have to move from one place to another. So I think they're, they're linked, the governmental change with the rise of the middle class. Also, um, the descriptions of these restaurants often are about people doing, uh, doing business there, right? Like most of the descriptions we have are that, that people are taking, um, that people who are merchants who are, who are like running whatever um, mercantile trade that they are doing are taking people out for these kinds of um, business deals and the other the other kind of space that that the descriptions like when they actually invoke like who is there are like parties um, right so again we like have a sense that like these these aren't <laughs> this isn't uh, the working class who is at these early restaurants. Um, and if I can add something from Hong Kong, I, I've spent a fair amount of time in Asia, and uh, in Hong Kong, we know about these things called dim sum restaurants, um, right? Where you have the little portions and the person comes around. Those actually were are places where business people spend two or three hours in the afternoon. And it, the full name of it is uh, Dim Sum Yum Cha, 
which is my bad way to say it in Cantonese, but it's the little, you know, the little eats and drinking tea. So it's really about drinking tea with colleagues who you want to um, interact in a mercantile way. And that's the origin of that kind of a restaurant. And it's become a kind of restaurant that anybody can eat in. But I've been in some of those where you could see those deals happening. And, you know, they wouldn't be bothered by um, having to order from a menu. Um, they would drink tea. And if somebody brought something around that they liked, and any of you have been in those restaurants on a little trolley, they would just say they wanted it. So that would not interrupt them while they were doing their business transaction. So it's another tweak on the restaurant to, to satisfy business folks um, who are busy but want to spend time in the restaurant um, having a meeting. Better place to have a meeting than on Zoom, probably. <laughs> Sorry. Um, were there any early precedents for Reading Terminal Market where many stalls were gathered under one roof? Yes. In fact, going back to China, uh, while uh, while our fancy businessmen were eating at these like crazy palaces where there were like uh, people who would sing, like the descriptions of these places are just intense. Uh, but you also have a really vibrant um, uh, food stall and cook shop culture in China at the same time in these cities uh, that we also have like beautiful lush descriptions of. Um, and you also, uh, I don't know if y'all remember the picture that Elliot showed of the cook shops in Cairo. Um, basically that the kind of notion that you have a market and that the market has many purveyors of food in it is actually like a it is probably like one of the older versions of this, right? Um, like that and people needing to eat on the side of the road, like those are the spaces where uh, eating as a commercial, uh, a commercial activity really arises. And if you go to Singapore these days, they, they have actually organized them in, and cleaned them up in different parts of the um, city. And, um, you know, you and literally have them organized in ways that you go down this aisle for this kind of food and this aisle for that kind of food. It's fascinating. Did the 19th century strangers guides um, include restaurants and were they rated as they are in the Michelin and other contemporary guidebooks? Um, the which guides? Strangers guides. I don't know them at all. I think that yeah. was Susan's question. Susan, can you tell us what more what what they were? Because we don't neither of us know that. Hang on, just logging in. So strangers guides were um, published regularly in the 19th century in ways that were similar to what we would think of as a travel guide. Like if you were coming into a city and you wanted to know where hotels were and also especially like major institutions and places to go. So things like guidebooks were kind of rooted in the strange, what they called the stranger's guides, like a stranger coming to a city. But I, and I have some examples of them, but I don't know that they had restaurants. And that's like one area where I'm not sure if they yet um, thought to guide people to those resources at, in addition to more like institutional guides, like educational institutions, museums, and other kinds of places would be spelled out in stranger's guides. So I didn't know if you had encountered that. So I haven't encountered the stranger's guides, but when we were doing our research, um, a lot of a lot of what we know about restaurants in the 19th century uh, come from travel logs and come from travel writing. Um, and a lot of that really does move people towards specific restaurants. Um, and and I wonder if it really was like a separate 
a separate way of writing and like if these are like kinds of parallel pieces of writing. Um, in the book we talk about uh, how some of this comes out of uh, the history of this guy named Grimaud who started basically uh, kind of like the rating and, uh, and jury and restaurant review system in Paris. Um, and so yeah, I think I, now I want to come and look at these things and like think about like are, are these like parallel histories or is there actually overlap there? That's super exciting. Thanks. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm always thinking about where things start to intersect with each other and you know where they're really different from each other. Susan, I think you need to give a lecture on strangers guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Come. Come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this was an add-on to um, the question about social isolation dining, and it's what was the 1918 flu's effect on restaurants? If that was something you covered in your research. Maybe, Katie, not, I'm sorry, I do not know. No, I don't know either. Um... I do know yeah. that various cities did things differently. Um, you know, Philadelphia and New York had very different kinds of um, reactions to it. And Philadelphia, I think, was the hardest hit city in the North. Um, and, but I don't know what about restaurants. I, mean, I, I believe that the signs that used to be on the subway of no spitting um, came from that period. But that's about all I know. I don't know about restaurants in terms of the pandemic. Yeah, it's an interesting niche topic. I read an article a few months ago about um, school practices during the 1918 flu and what was sort of similar and different than based on what was already going on or what, what science and tools they had. And there are a lot of interesting parallels. And uh, Jamie, we don't have much time left. I see Jamie was asking, do we talk about the history and practice of tipping in the in the book, we do in fact do that. We have, we, we're very um, interested in people who work in restaurants. And um, so we've, we've only covered a tiny bit of what, what is in the book. Um, there's a lot about waiters and waitresses and tipping. And um, so come, come get our book. <laughs> Katie and I did this book uh, because well, I know why I did it, and I think Katie was, was happy to do it the same way, which was to write a book that's not in academic prose, because we're both academics, and we get tired of writing that for a very small group of people. So we wanted to write something that would be serious and well-researched, but written in English <laughs> that people could read. So, and we did it with a wonderful press. If you ever see books from Reaction Press, it's a... Uh, with a K instead of a, a London publisher. Uh, all of the books are beautifully um, designed, highly illustrated, and and geared at people. I think like all of us are interested in this kind of issue, you know, something that matters to us as part of our lives, and it's written in a language that is accessible to everybody. I'm just going to put in a plug to the pandemic question that the Mütter Museum has an exhibit, Spitting, Don't Spit Equals Death. I forget exactly what the title is, but they do have an exhibit about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, and um, that might be a timely thing. I don't know how much they deal with restaurants, small sub topic within the um, epidemic. However, people might want to check it out. Um, they're one of our colleagues and we really enjoy working with them. I also want to thank Katie and Elliot for two wonderful talks that were quite different, but all bridge this incredibly rich subject of restaurants and their history because it's part of our cultural landscape in a way that interlocks with so many things. And I think it's inexhaustible. So we hope you'll be back to speak for the Wagner again. And we thank everyone for coming back and for joining us. And we hope we see you again for more of our talks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>